If anybody's been uh, following the news lately, uh, which means I think all you have to do is basically be alive or might be able to watch Jay, Jay Leno to know this one, that uh, Kathy Lee Gifford got slammed pretty well. She was uh, she has a line of clothing that sells in Walmart, and uh, there was a, a labor union group or a group funded by labor unions that disclosed that some of these outfits that were made uh, for Walmart were put together in this factory in Honduras where little children were working and making like 31 cents an hour or something of that uh, amount. And of course, obviously, here is Kathy Lee who makes millions and she's <coughs> sweating her money out of, the, out of the labor of these little children and paying them only 31 cents an hour. And uh, of course, there is this uproar, and um, you know she got blindsided pretty well with it, and defended herself for a while. But then started paying penance and agreed that this is terrible, that she wouldn't use this factory anymore, and started giving money to liberal causes and appearing on state on the same uh, podium with uh, Robert uh, the Third Reich, our, <laughs> our Secretary of Labor, and so it's a. Uh, uh, this was yet another chapter in, in a, something that's been going on for about 200 years, and this whole question of child labor. Uh, it wasn't just Kathy Lee. The other night, Dateline ran a story about child labor elsewhere, and this one was on Nike. And they had Phil Knight, who's worth, I guess his net worth is over a billion dollars. You know, he started the Nike company. I remember back in the 70s. I remember because my coach made me get the first pair of shoes that Nike ever made, and uh, they fell apart after the first rain. Uh, and they've gotten better since then. But the uh, the story was this: that Nike was using these little children in Pakistan to make soccer balls, paying them, I think, six cents a ball or something. And you would have, I think Life Magazine had done a pictorial study, and they had this little boy in a shop sewing together the soccer ball. And here is the evil Phil Knight, worth billions, and he's uh, making his riches out of the labor of these little Pakistani children. And, you know, it's one of these things that makes a very, very good contrast. Here's a poor little child here. Here's rich Phil Knight. And the whole thing starts this uh, this debate about child labor. And, you know, I thought, well, uh, you know, how do we deal with this particular subject? This is one in which everybody wants little children to have happy childhoods. You know, I have a daughter who's 19, and I hope she had a happy childhood. Uh, it's about over now. But, um, and do we really want little children working in factories and being exposed to all the evils and that factory work gives, or do we want our children working at all? I mean, what what is what should be policy about this? And generally, the argument gets framed in little children should be work, you know, should be in school. They should be having a happy childhood. They shouldn't be working. And um, I was wondering, is that really? what the alternatives are. Is that really what the case is? And so I just started look, looking a little bit into to child labor. Uh, did something for the free market or sure did I really say that Jeffrey, that I wrote something and then Jeffrey took my scribblings and made them into a coherent article uh, in the September free market and um, you know about this this whole thing. Um, all of us are obviously are familiar with the with uh, the child labor issue. This is something that really started coming up during the Industrial Revolution. And what I've done for my talk today, I've um, I want to go back to the good old pre-Victorian and Victorian days and look at what was going on with child labor, what was going on before the factory system came about. Uh, why were children working? And then, kind of fast forward, you know, talk a little bit about America when the anti-child labor movement started around the uh, the late 1800s and the turn of this century with the progressive movement, and kind of work our way to the future. If anybody has any questions, by the way, just feel free to to um, ask. But um, you know, before the factory system, we had uh, in rural England, what is known as the cottage industries. And here's how it worked. You would have an entrepreneur who would 
you know, be selling something, maybe be selling, you know, cloth to tailors. And it was his job, of course, to get the cloth to the tailors. And how would he do it? Well, he would go into the countryside where people lived, and he would contract out with people who would make the cloth in their homes, or they would spin thread in their homes, do something uh, in their homes, and he would come by and, and collect that and pay them for it. And this is what was known as the cottage industry. And basically what you had were people would have these hand looms in their homes, and um, the whole family would work together. Well, how has this been presented historically? It's been presented as a warm and fuzzy and cozy system. What a wonderful way you had the families working together and everybody was happy. England was a glorious place. The people were making a good living and life went on. And then, you know, as it's pointed out, then the factory system came about and threw all this stuff into an uproar and started ruining the lives of families and ruining the lives of little children. Well, what actually was the situation? I mean, were the cottage industries, uh, was this a situation of, of wonderful, warm and fuzzy uh, little home factories? Well, you've got to understand what it was that people were doing. They were hand weaving cloth. Now, for the most part, they would have uh, a loom, mostly if they, very few of them owned the looms, they would be renting them from somebody or if they, they would have to have paid pretty high payments. Uh, it was a slow, tedious process. They worked about 12 to 14 hours a day, um, despite having seen, uh, you know, movies like Rob Roy, where everybody in all in the countryside lived in these warm and, and cozy uh, little um, cabins um, with nice wooden rafters and the like. <coughs> the truth of the matter is, what you had were poorly ventilated little huts, and these places were uh, full of vermin. Uh, if you had a, uh, when you, your clothes, you had better make sure that your clothes lasted a long, long time, which meant you never washed them. And uh, because if you washed them, they would fall apart. You'd work 12, like I said before, 12 to 14 hours a day in dark, poorly ventilated, tough conditions. One uh, writer at the time wrote that the best thing about these little huts or, or cottages or whatever you wanted to call them was that they did burn down quite easily. And. Uh, <laughs> But that was about the best they could say for them. Well, what about the children? Um, we had this idea of children pl happily playing in the countryside and the like. Well, in the cottage industries, they were not happily playing in the countryside. They were helping their families, doing this very hard, monotonous work. You know, if you know anything about hand looms, you know, you run the, sh you push the shuttle through, push, you know, back and forth. That was the work. I mean, it was not the most creative stuff in the world. It was just, you know, run the shuttle through, push it. And um, the problem was for the entrepreneurs was this was a very, the transactions costs of the system were obviously, obviously quite high. And in, one of the things we know about entrepreneurship is that entrepreneurs are constantly trying to find new ways of doing things. And that's literally how these inventions, for example, like the spinning jenny came about. The spinning jenny was, I think, at first set up with about eight different uh, spindles. And uh, in fact, uh, nervous people destroyed the the spinning jenny several times uh, because they, the idea that hey these guys they're going to make uh, more than us and they're going to put us out of business or whatever but to be honest the new this mechanism of the uh, textile industry came about because uh, entrepreneurs were looking for ways to be able to um, lower their transactions costs and to be able to get people in a more centralized place. And the early factories were quite small. And in fact, they had an advantage in that for the first time, the employer was actually providing the tools for the worker free of charge. You know, the risk was on the employer. You didn't have to take these things out to each little uh, cottage. If you had a centralized place where you could, uh, where you could work. And it actually, in a lot of ways, it was easier work for the people who were uh, who were the workers as opposed to what was going on in the little cottages. And they've talked about the early factories being, you know, poorly lit places, whatever. Well, uh, they a lot of them were not very nice places to work. Uh, neither were the homes. 
It's not like they were going from a warm and you know, cozy place to this horrible factory at least in the early stages. They were going from a, uh, a rat-infested, vermin inf- you know, bug-infested little shack to go work uh, elsewhere. And <coughs> the factory system literally developed from this very, very small beginnings. And then as the, uh, the things that were able to, to change, they were able to, uh, you know, I won't go through all the different inventions like the... Uh, the flying shuttle and the uh, uh, spinning mule and the like, and but they were able to develop larger machines, power them with water power, and then the development of the steam engine towards the end of the 18th century allowed these uh, these factories to be located in places other than just by a river where they had happened to have uh, you know either rapids or some some kind of fall line. And it enabled the factories to be a little more mobile, and actually, to a certain extent, they could go to where the people were. That's when the factories started opening up in the cities, where where the people were. But um, we do know that in the industrial revolution, you know, that in the factory system, the children went to work. They had already been working. This was not an unusual occurrence that little children were working. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that we have to keep coming back to. Uh, people tend to romanticize and say, well, gosh, in the cottage industries or down the farm, the little children got to work side by side with their parents in these happy, cozy conditions. Well, yes, they worked side by side. Uh, John Locke wrote about three-year-old ch- children going to work, children being apprenticed by the time that they were ten, and a lot of apprenticeships were, were basically a uh, form of, uh, you know, it's very much a, a harsh uh, condition of servitude. In the factories, a lot of families did stay pretty much together. In fact, ironically, it was uh, the Factory Acts of, I believe, 1832 or 1833, which separated working times for children and adults, which actually did more to break up that family situation than anything that the factories ever did. Um, but the, um, the system would work when the children, by the way, they were assigned pretty much easy tasks. Uh, these machines, you would have the threads would break, and so the children would be, <coughs> would be assigned, if there was a broken thread, they would tie, them, uh, tie the threads back together. Uh, generally speak, you know, it's, it's kind of hard, to, uh, one of the questions that they asked were children and women use this substitutes for males. One of the uh, uh, arguments is always, well, that they, factory owners would rather hire children and, and uh, women. Um, because they could pay them less than they could pay men. Well, if that were the case, then there wouldn't have been any men working in England at all, at least in the factories. Uh, to a certain extent, they were substitutes because machinery <coughs> took a lot of the um, back-breaking aspects of the labor you know, out of, uh, out of commission, that there were things that children could do that they might not have been able to do before. But generally, uh, you know, the children were not made to do the hard you know, labor. I mean, no employ- you know, this, this idea that the children were doing all the backbreaking stuff is absolutely ludicrous. I've even, I've been reading about even uh, Clark Nardinelli, uh, used to be at Clemson, wrote a book on uh, child labor and the Industrial Revolution, and and uh, he points out a number of things. Even, and I'm just talking really about the factory system, not even the mines or whatever. But even the mines, it was not the children who were doing the backbreaking work. It would have been silly for the employers to to hire children to make them do jobs that they couldn't do. Generally, they did the easier type of jobs. Um, and um, so, at any rate, what I would like to do in this uh, my, my talk is, you know, I've, I've talked about the beginnings of the system uh, I want to go through a number of myths and then facts and we have myths about child labor and the industrial revolution I'd like to answer them with facts I'd also like to point out something to you and that is that we condemn child labor I mean, Life magazine goes to Pakistan and they condemn seeing this little boy sawing a soccer ball well that particular uh, industry, it's very much a cottage industry. It is the picture of what cottage industries were like back in the old days. And uh, I'm going to get a little bit later on talking about how progressives 
talk, you know, love third world and cottage industries. I've got some interesting pictures to show you from a Mennonite book, uh, which ends up extolling child labor. The very people who condemn child labor also <coughs> extol at the same time. Kind of runs, I think, a very, very interesting uh, little uh, contradiction. But back in the uh, 1970s, there was a man named E.F. Schumacher. Probably some of you have heard of him. Wrote a book called Small is Beautiful, and he was extolling, you know, if we could make, you know, return to these little appropriate technologies, sustainable development, which meant cottage industries, which is uh, what you see in places like Pakistan, where kids are working for six cents, uh, you know, a soccer ball or whatever. That. That is how we lived once upon a time. That's how our ancestors lived. And so if we, when we talk about third world cottage industries, we're looking at a picture of what we used to be like back before the factory system came about. But anyway, I want to have some myths and facts. All right, first myth is the factory system actually meant that workers received lower pay than what they had earned under the cottage system. They did not migrate to the factories because wages were higher, but rather because increased productivity destroyed their old jobs. That's a very, you know, in other words, this was very much an involuntary migration. That people really preferred, in fact, they were better off under cottage industries, but they, you know, they couldn't produce enough to compete with the factories, so they got pulled into the factories and thus into a terrible uh, way of living. Well, uh, I've got my fact, as any decent economist knows, and I hope I have a room full of decent economists anyway, uh, increased wages come about as a result of increased productivity. That in neoclassical, and I know that's somewhat of a bad word in here, but there's a concept of the wage equaling your marginal productivity. And in fact, by the way, Nardinelli points out that children basically received marginal productivity type wages that, uh, throughout this uh, uh, Victorian system, you know, throughout the Victorian era. Um, in neoclassical terms, wages, wages reflect marginal productivity. Far from being a monopsony, by the way, the factory system was generally very, very competitive. There were hundreds of little mills, and they had to pay competitive wages. I mean, that was, um, that was a part of that system. The fact that the workers' lives improved materially demonstrates that the real purchasing power increased. One of the things that occurred was workers were able to start af uh, affording goods. They could actually underwear started coming into being at this time. That uh, uh, people had a change of clothes. They were able to wear cotton goods for the first time ever. And uh, and in fact, it's, it's interesting. Some of the people try to turn it on its head and said, well, that was a uh, you know that they were instead of wearing you know, they were able to wear cheaper cotton goods instead of the, these heavier woolen garments and that was proof that their standard of living was going down. Well, it actually points out you know that these folks they didn't have to worry about clothes lasting for years and years because they were able to um, afford more things. And the only way that that you can afford more things, your real wage has to be going up. And so I you know it's one of these things that I think that it's evident on its face unless you just take the logic and turn it upside down. Another myth, the quality of children's lives deteriorated with the coming of the factory system. They went from a happy, carefree life in the country to a hellish existence in the city. Uh, fact, child mortality rates dropped dramatically with the advent of the factory system. Now, according to Robert Hessen, the rates, uh, child um, <coughs> mortality rates in the late 1700s dropped from about 7 to 75% uh, to 32 percent in the early 1800s. Now I don't know where Hessen got those figures. Clark Nardinelli has the earlier child mortality rates being much lower. But we do know this: that generally speaking, that child mortality rates in pre-industrial England were astoundingly high. And we talk about the average life expectancy being 29 years old. Well, one of the reasons is because you've got a whole bunch of zeros. You're adding a whole bunch of zeros and taking an average, and I think about half, for what I know, half the children died before age five. There was somewhat of a system where you didn't even name your children for a while because you didn't know if they were going to survive. And uh, women would generally have a lot of children, uh, the idea being that uh, not that many of them were going to survive. But that was, and that was part of a way of life. And it began to change with the Industrial Revolution. Uh, we had a talk here last uh spring by a fellow uh, named Brian Ellison who pointed out that the uh, 
uh, disease rates started to fall during the Industrial Revolution and hit one. And, and we don't, we have no idea. You know, this is even before vaccines. Real, well, they had vaccines, kind of very crude vaccines at the time. But his point was that people started becoming much more forward-looking. You know, in the old cottage industry system, here's something to think about. Your lifestyle was as good as it was going to get. In other words, you you know you were going to make subsistence wages. You were not going to get any more productive in that system. That which you know, in other words, your life in terms of being able to quote, climb. There wasn't any ladder to climb. You were there. You were at the top rung of your personal ladder. And the factory system literally gave people an opportunity to think about a future, become more forward-looking. And um, we, you know, young, as we point, I point out before, young children did work in the pre-industrial age, whether it was on the farm or the home. And uh, one of the things to remember about farm work: farm work is was not exactly easy work. Um, the one of, the, for example, the harvest in those days, you would take the sickle, you were bending over, cutting. Seeds and you know people, be, you know, uh, they became stooped over. That kind of labor literally uh, wore you out. And you know we have this. I don't know. We have this idea that the children just running around happy and carefree and like. And then you know Simon Legree makes them go work in the factories. And you know that's just not the way things work. Okay, myth. Women and children were. Per- I've dealt with this a little bit before. Women and children were perfect substitutes for adult men. Which meant that factory owners preferred hiring children, which meant that men went unemployed. Uh, in fact, while it is true that the advent of machinery meant that, quote, weaker people could do more work, the work that only men had performed before, women and children were not perfect substitutes. Um, a. Bear and Eklund point out in, in their text here that um, there was some, um, that certain, to a certain extent, they were substitutes. But it's pretty obvious they weren't perfect substitutes because the women and children outnumbered the men in England at that time. Had they been perfect substitutes and willing to work for less, you know, every man in England would have been unemployed. Um, had, you know, access, um, as I point out, what we do see is that if real wages rise as they did throughout the 19th century, child labor dropped as a percentage of the workforce. Um, in the United States, child labor dropped drastically in the early decades of the 20th century despite the lack of restrictive laws. In fact, I found an old editorial in the New York Times. This one is from, um, let me see, October 23, 1937. It was not written by Henry Hazlitt. All right. um, I already checked that one out in your book, Jeff. But it was entitled Liberalism and Tempo. And it's pointing out that the difference in the liberal uh, spirit he did with capital L. And it says, for example, <coughs> talk about progress. President Roosevelt said in his last fireside chat that the democratic processes are bound to be slower than dictatorial processes, but they need not be dangerously slow. And he asked, what is dangerously slow? Surgeons say the knife should be used only in emergency, but the world has noted a strong tendency in surgeons to diagnose emergencies. So the new liberalism of the capital finds itself too often facing crises that simply will not wait. And um, he talks about uh, child labor here. He says, the old liberal spirit would admit that child labor is a blot on any nation. But it would... It would point out that without the intervention of Congress in 20 years from 1910 to 1930, we had cut down child labor by four-fifths. Mr. Roosevelt's phrase about goods being produced in the sweat of little children makes the picture too dark. For every 200 factory workers in the country, there was in the year 1930 just one child under the age of 16. And that year we had less than 700,000 such young wage earners, of whom nearly half a million were on the farm. Uh, I said, if the proportion of child workers in 1930 were as high as 20 years earlier, we should have not 700,000 children at work, but 2,700,000. And and again, they were they were not arguing against child labor laws, by the way, in in this particular editorial. But in essence, they gave they answered you know the question about child labor. 
and gave, I think, unwittingly, the economic point of view, the you know more certainly the more libertarian point of view that you know children you know we had fewer children at work. We'll be dealing with that. You know why did the, the percentage of child labor drop? Um, and obviously, we're dealing with opportunity costs. What happens over a period of time as wages rise? because we become more productive. That productivity is reflected in the fact that now children, you know, families had some opportunities. In the early days, you have to understand that children went to work because the families needed the income. It wasn't a case of the you know, child saying, Daddy, I want to go to school today. No, son, you're going to go to work. That was not the situation, especially in the early days of the Industrial Revolution. It was, this child has to work when it's possible or we don't eat, I mean, this family does not survive, or it survives very much just on the edge. That was the reality of life. And I think we often forget that, you know, how our ancestors lived, that, you know, life very much could be on the edge. Um, here's another myth. Crusaders against child laborers were simply humanitarians who wanted a better life for children, who were fighting against the evil capitalists who wanted to work children to death. And for the most part, the crusades against child labor were a larger part of rent-seeking by the upper classes and labor unions. Uh, it's a nice little quote. I used it in the uh, article for, you know, the Kathy Lee article. But um, here is what Nassau Senior, the economist, uh, had to say about the, uh, uh, and this is uh, in 18, around 1843. Um, he said that talk about the uproar against child labor. The workers' original object was to raise the price of their own labor. This is talking about the spinners. For this purpose, the spinners, who form a very small but powerful body among them, finding that they could not obtain a limitation of the hours of work to ten by combination, tried to effect it through the legislature. They knew that Parliament would not legislate for adults. They got up, therefore, a frightful, and as far as we have heard and seen, an utterly unfounded picture of the ill treatment of the children and the hope that the legislature would restrain all persons under 18 years old to 10 hours, which they knew would, in fact, restrict the labor of adults to the same period. Um, and in other words, that uh, we see even back then, Dr. LeBan, the early stirrings of public choice, of <laughs> interest group theory. Of you know how it is that you know, that small you know that the small but very powerful groups which are able to um, try to affect legislation and uh, basically what we have always found are worker uh, unions and worker groups becoming allied with the so-called progressives. Um, it's very interesting you know that when people did real live investigations you would, you could always find horror stories but generally speaking children were treated. You know, basically, as other workers, uh, probably by today's standards, we wouldn't like some of the treatment that we saw, but that was pretty much standard for the day. That's just the way people were. Now, what you also had at that time uh, in England were a number of romantic writers coming to the fore. Uh, you had people like Charles Dickens. You know, we have Oliver Twist. Uh, another of my favorites. I actually like his poetry a lot, but. Uh, uh, you have William Wordsworth and writes London 1802. You know, Milton, thou shouldst be living at this hour. England hath need of thee. Uh, or uh, William Blake, who wrote, remember the uh, the poem and it, it's, it's put the music and did those feet in ancient times walk upon England's uh, mountains green. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> then there is uh, and was Jerusalem built it here among these dark saint mills and this was the picture that was uh, um, that was put out now what about the picture of the United States well I pulled out an old book uh, written in 1914 uh, one of the uh, they had three writers Edwin Markham Benjamin Lindsay and George Creel and uh, it was from the uh, one of the the progressive groups that uh, from the child from the International Child Welfare League, and uh, Edwin Markham was a was a well-known American poet, and the first thing they had this picture of a little child being draped, sacrificed at the altar of prophet, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, children in bondage, and it's it's interesting that um, and this is how it. 
this is how it starts out. And this here's the point was that the writing was never really done to say this is what the situation is. It was this is how. Um, let me get, read you a little paragraph to point out how people would deal with quote child labor on the, on the other side. In these United States, dedicated to freedom, justice, and fraternity, I thought that was France, but uh, fraternity, nearly two million little children are fed annually into the steel jaws of the modern industrial machine. Mammon has proved no less cruel to the little ones than the of, of the world than Moloch. Remember, Moloch was the was the pagan god in uh, Hebrew times. They sacrificed little children to they have them burned to death. Herod is held in detestation, yet he was more kind in that he slew outright. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly two million golden boys and girls, citizens of the future and mothers that might be, mangled mind, body, and soul, and aborted into a maturity robbed of power and promise. They make no cry, these tiny victims. They are too tired. One listens in vain. <laughs> For some bitter wail to ring high and clear above the roar of the machinery that has them in its grasp. <clears throat> but the commonwealths of the Republic, like huge shells of the sea, are filled with their sighings. Listen where one will, and one may hear it. For few indeed are the states in all this great country that come into the public court of public opinion with clean hands. Look where we will, will look where we will, we may see, for the stretch of the two million is from east to west from north to south. Mark them as they huddle in the darkness, the squalor and the disease of city tenements, pouring youth and hope and happiness into the myriad inconsequentialities that they make for the adornment of those who preen themselves in the upper sunlight. And uh, it's, I mean, literally the whole book is this. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is the prose, and this, this is what we see as a discussion of child labor. Um, you get an A for alliteration. Mm-hmm. Actually, then that's not Edwin Markham's chapter. Markham, Markham wrote the Crimson in Our Cotton. <laughs> <laughs> in detailing the sordid tragedy of child labor, occupation by occupation, so that the horror of it may be blazed like another handwriting on the wall. What more natural than the than that commencement should be made with what has been well termed the Herod among industries? Come, let us go into the weaving rooms of the cotton mills and behold in the hot, damp, decaying atmosphere little wan figures flying in hideous cotillion among looms and wheels, children choked and blinded by clouds of lint forever molting from the webs, children deafened by the jar and uproar of the eternal, eternal Niagara of machines, children silenced utterly in the desert desolation of the never-ceasing clamor, children that seem like specter shapes doomed to silence and done with life, beckoning to one another across some thunder-shaken inferno. Um, that, that's Edwin Markham. Uh, and again, and this is, the problem is, is this is what's passing for a discussion on child labor. <laughs> and, you know, it doesn't say anything. I mean, we could say that about graduate students. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Where are the elephant voices when we? <laughs> yeah. Uh, or the poor workers doing envelopes in the Mises Institute. <laughs> <laughs> but the you know the uh, you know myth child labor ended because concerned citizens and progressive legislators banded together to put an end to this brutality. In fact, child labor ended as incomes rose and is more value maximizing for children to go to school as to ensure future incomes. And also, the mother and the father, and later on just the father, until the modern age anyway, was making enough to support the family. Capital, all that awful industrial machine, made large school, large scale schooling and child labor obsolete, and I put in front in uh, boldface, for the first time in history. Uh, myth. Progressives are against child labor. Um, in fact, progressives have generally favored child labor as long as it's part of the pre-industrial uh, cottage industry structure. Um, let me, I want to show you something. This is uh, this is from folks who who have absolutely riled and gone against the factory system. And uh, this was a book. And you know, it's not that I'm, I don't want to attack Mennonites per se, or even. Doris, Doris, the late Doris Longacre, who wrote this book. I'm sure she was a good woman, and uh, but 
she was writing about you know how North Americans you know were you know the usual stuff we're despoiling the world and and uh, we work too hard and that uh, the like and it has this <coughs> section about looking at, look again and looking at the third world and, and how maybe you know these in the third world significant values are expressed which may be missing from our lives a second look at these for these aspects is revealing well she's got a picture this is a young child these young children working in their uh, this is in I believe Lebanon uh, in the Jordan North Jordan in this family weaving business in North Jordan we got the father is a, is a visible example to his children children. Uh, by the way, in the early factories, you know, the families generally did keep together. You know, they'd come to work together and, and the like. Uh, but the father is a visible example to his children. You know, like this one. Children learn survival skills and do not require entertainment. Younger children <laughs> learn from older ones. And it's got the child, you know, children, you know, having to, you know, put this stuff together. Use of hands keeps a sane balance between physical and mental activity. And then uh, the non-renewable energy requirements are non-existent. That's because they're doing everything by hand. The materials <laughs> used are produced locally. Uh, and I couldn't help but put a couple other things in there too. That's a woman in Chad, you know, uh, sitting in the dirt um, with a with a meal. And it says a home environment in Chad uses naturally replenished uh, materials for building. It's called straw. <laughs> Use the sunlight as a natural disinfectant. <laughs> provides an unpolluted, restore, restorative environment. Provides a oneness with the natural order. Now, like this one, you, reduces utensils to a few important ones, which <laughs> give a sense of unity to each home and to the community. <laughs> um, and then the third one has this man stripping buds out of a tree, and um, climbing the tree. Says. Look, subsistence living in upper volta pushes resourcefulness to an extreme. Buds being gathered from a tree will be used in a gravy served with millet. Well, the only thing is, of course, once you strip buds from a tree, then <laughs> you've <laughs> basically stripped the you know the photosynthesis process from that poor tree when you kill it off, <laughs> um, which is not exactly uh, a restorative. But <laughs> this, is, and by, you know, and you had the uh, progressive movement tied in with these folks, and with you know, small is beautiful. I mean, what what they want is a return to child labor. I mean, because you would have to have child labor as you know, in the third world. They you know, return to what uh, we saw the little boy. All of us, all our children would be sewing little soccer balls, sewing something by hand for six cents under that old system. And, uh, of course, um, you know, I think that that's, that shows to me there's a, it's a real sense of moral bankruptcy when we're dealing with some of these opponents for the out and out hypocrisy. I'm going to talk about one other aspect in what John Wells told me just before we came down here in a minute. But a few more, uh, one more myth. In fact, families were separated when children began to work in factories. And, and as I point out, greater damage came to families came of the Factory Acts of 1833, which set different working hours for children and adults. This, according to Nardinelli, shifted some of the care for children from parents to the government. So we have aspects of the welfare state even as early as 1833. Um, and I've dealt with just some of the fallacies, uh, informal fallacies. We've got the hasty generalization or false cause. The factory system created poverty and misery. Uh, in truth, living conditions for lower classes were miserable, be they in the city or the countryside. Granted, there was much jerry-built housing in the cities as people moved in from the countryside. But one thing, they had a window tax uh, in uh, England at the time. And so... One of the things that you did, and I got this from a book that F. A. Hayek edited, uh, Capitalism and Historians, that, uh, you know, so you had incentive to have fewer windows. Uh, it's true the factory system did change uh, work habits of people. Timeliness, timeliness became much more important, which did away with some of the more casual atmosphere working. Um, and then the second one, I love this one, which, you know, and which with the Markham book was, it's the appeal to pity. And, uh, we know that, you know, if you've taken a logic course, you know that that's one of the informal fallacies of logic. And um, the arguments against child labor were framed in overly dramatic language instead of using facts. 
But uh, if the majority of children in the USA and the United Kingdom had been sacrificed at the altar of profit during the eight, late 19th and early 20th centuries, they would have produced a nation of sick weaklings and hardly the energetic societies which led the world in production. I think that you know if we had been killing off all our children, as they were saying, then uh, it, it seems to me that it would have reflected it. Um, and, and the last thing I want to go into is child labor today, just very quickly, because uh, there's still a huge debate about that. The USA Today had an editorial um, basically defending child labor in third world countries because they said, look, these children go to work out of necessity. Well, the opposing view was written by uh, our friend Ralph Nader. And um, he's talked about... Um, this is uh, a form of child abuse. Children do not work because economic conditions demand it, but because societies permit it. In every developing country where child labor is widespread, there is widespread adult unemployment. Putting children in schools would put more adults to work. And actually, putting children in schools, uh, which don't exist, um, kicking <laughs> children out of the factories would put more of Ralph Nader's uh, allies to work. Uh, and it says, manufacturers can afford to pay adult workers. Labor costs are typically a small portion of the cost of making goods, and consumers are even willing to pay extra. One study found that 84% of American consumers would pay $1 more in a $20 shirt to ensure that it was not made with child labor. Um, and going on and on. Well, John Wells told me a very, very interesting story. And in fact, um, and it was uh, the USA Today editorial tends to be, very much tends to back it up. He said a couple Christmases ago he was at a factory in Bangladesh and he said that you know they had children working in there and they were making pajamas uh, to be sent to the United States. And he said that the you know children were treated well um, and the like but he said the thing that he realized was those children were there because they had to be there because that's how they had to survive. And that um, and the sad thing was the place was about to be shut down the children were about to be sent out in the streets because of pressure from the United States from you know from uh, special interest groups here to stop child labor abroad and he said that what was going to happen was these children would be sent out in the streets well Oxfam which is hardly a you know a capitalist uh, it's a British quote you know charity and it's hardly a defender of capitalism well Oxfam uh tracked a number of children who were laid off in Bangladesh as a result of this agitation of the United States. And Oxfam, according to the USA Today, the charity Oxfam found that most of these children took more hazardous jobs, many becoming prostitutes. Um, that's part of the reality of it. And that um, we know, you know, there are some things we know historically. Um, it's kind of funny. The New York Times, even though it was advocating child labor laws, made a very good case for why we don't need them. Points out in the absence of child labor laws, the vast majority of children working in factories dropped. Why? Because good old opportunity cost. Something we're supposed to learn the very first day in economics. That the truth of the matter is that the factory system does work. I mean, if we don't want children to work, promote the factory system, promote productivity, and allow productivity to exist elsewhere, and allow third world countries to be able to, to develop and sell goods to the United States. In the long run, that will eliminate child labor there if that's what we want to do. Uh, you know, I don't like the idea of you know, we're going to have an economy for certain social goals, but we do know that over a period of time, these are some things that, hap you know, that, that occur. So, in kind of in closing, um, and I want to point out that again, I think that I don't think there's anything immoral without of saying, you know, it's not a bad thing for Nike to be contracting with these folks. Uh, I mean, even if it does mean that little children are are working. Same way with Kathy <coughs> Lee. Um, you know that uh, uh, she's not one of my favorite characters, but. Uh, uh, I thought she got an unfair rap, and the problem is, of course, when you're a celebrity and image is everything, there's no way to intellectually be able to defend yourself. And so I think that this is one of those things for us that we we know the truth. We also know, in some ways, it's intellectually hard to uh, to defend because of all the other emotions and you know, and children in bondage type arguments that we get. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.
other comments, questions? Um, I think it's kind of interesting, though. You, you sort of made a, a point, and you made it implicitly, but uh, tried to draw it down implicitly, is, is that people, when they start to talk about child labor and isn't it horrible, they're comparing, say, today with then. What they, when then what they need to be doing is comparing then with the period before. Mm -hmm. You know, people look at it and say, well, we don't want child labor. We want our kids in school. You know, we don't need them working and, and, and slaving away and, and being, you know, potentially harmed. We wouldn't want that right now for our children. Well, we don't want that for our children because we don't need that for our children now. But back then, mm -hmm. you know, as you pointed out, it was necessary. No one, I've never heard anybody make an argument that looked and said, well, you know, what was, what was as you did, you know, the cottage industry like? And what did the factory acts do? It's always, what do we have now? No, I don't think that... To be honest, I don't think that uh, Robert Reich really cares what happens to children in the third world, but he sure does care what happens to his union supporters at home. Mm -hmm. And uh, to a certain extent, I think this this will actually st it'll actually stunt the economic growth of these folk of these other countries. I think it'll it'll actually cause more problems because uh, uh, no matter what those they make, if they make a dollar, if they they go from 15 cents an hour to a dollar an hour. The unions complain about that. They go to two dollars. These folks are only working for two dollars an hour. They're only working for three dollars an hour. How can we compete with that? I mean, that the argument's always going to be made. Yeah. Let's let's uh, <clears throat> follow that line of reasoning a little bit more. Um, if we have a country where we have children who are working, and that's a very typical situation. Then we have the United States paying for their education, bribing parents so that they can take their children and educate them. <clears throat> so now, say, you know, ten decade or decade and a half later, now we have all these educated people. Can a country like that just automatically produce those sorts of jobs that these people are going to be looking for? Or are we just going to have a whole bunch of highly educated people doing the same thing that they were before. That's one of the problems of, say, India, some of these third world countries, especially, that you have a lot of highly educated people that really have nowhere to go. Um, and uh, part of it is because I think there is a natural progression of an economy. And if you try to block that somehow or try to do it artificially, you're going to end up with all sorts of, of imbalances that uh, are not easily remedied. I, you know, I, would, I think, you, I think you're, you're hitting on a very good point. The, the, the country is leapfrogging and not building up the capital necessary to support these. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, because what happens when the subsidy runs out? You know, I mean, the United States is basically, are we going to be, uh, are we going to be sending money abroad to prop up people uh, in this country? I mean, it's just, uh, it's, you, know, you think about it, it's kind of insidious. Uh, we're lowering our standard of living, so, quote, in the name of somehow raising our standard of living. Well, I have two observations. Uh, first of all, it seems to me it's very debatable whether you regard the law as a leading, leading indicator or a lagging indicator in something like this. I think mm -hmm. you can make a very good case that, in fact, uh, the law ends up being a lagging indicator mm -hmm. irrespective of uh, underlying trends such as uh, 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 an increasing value of human capital relative to physical capital or, or non-human capital. Uh, so that people start having fewer and fewer kids and the value of kids, of educated kids, becomes higher. And that, in fact, they enact laws against child labor long after these deeper trends in the, in the economy are already well underway. And that, in fact, the, all the rhetoric really doesn't amount to much other than sort of justifying a deeper trend that's been going on anyway. Uh, that's one observation. The second observation is uh, I think you ask a very... So that's, in some sense, that's a historical scientific question. Uh -huh. Okay, number one, and you could couple that, in fact, with probably a good rent-seeking story, which runs essentially as follows: that during the that same time period, uh, as more uh, uh, capital-intensive procedures or processes were developed for production, um, that on balance, that, that that started defining an interest group that mm -hmm. could make short-term rents available to them by outlawing their labor-intensive competition yeah. 
uh, at least in the short run, maybe not in the long run, but certainly in the short run. And I suspect with a little bit of good scientific work, you can uncover whether that was very valid or not. Mm -hmm. uh, my second observation <coughs> is more of a question, and that is, uh, John Sofcles here has argued for some time that when you take away the economic value associated with people, that has consequences. And he's argued that in the context of slavery, where uh, slaves at one point, when slavery was legal, that meant that people had economic value. And rather than just uh, uh, engaging in genocide when you wanted to take over the neighboring tribe uh, because you couldn't enslave them because people wouldn't buy them, they had no value. At least with slaves having an economic value or imparting economic value to people, when you wanted to take over the neighboring tribe, you kept them all alive because they had value. <coughs> well, I think you can make the same argument about uh, uh, something like child labor laws. <laughs> and it'd be very interesting, it seems to me, to look at how children were treated in, along any of a number of dimensions mm -hmm. when child labor laws were passed because effectively what they do is they, they diminish, if not completely wipe out, the economic value associated <coughs> with children, which presumably gives parents and all those all other people, but particularly parents who have yeah. the biggest vested interest there, the biggest incentive to take good care of their kids. Yeah. Um, actually, you can add to that, um, what does that do to birth rates? I mean, if the children are worth less, wouldn't, that, wouldn't there be fewer of them? Well, at that point, children become somewhat of a drain. Right. Uh, the economic drain that uh, uh, because what happens is that you have to um, put more money in you know you, you put more money into them earlier you don't get as much return from them um, <coughs> and you know it's hard to uh, I, th I think for, it's, for example in the third world uh, the children are looked at as a very important asset and that they are the parents social security um, that uh, Parents complain, I mean, people complain about large families in the third world and overpopulation and the like, but uh, um, the smaller, you know, smaller families means that the older people are going to have fewer people caring for them in their old age. And it's going to, you know, and then they will be in much of an, econ uh, an economic burden. Kind of interesting in China, you know, which has been following this one uh, child policy for years. One of the interesting things that has occurred is that we're talking about China, which is a society that for centuries revered its elders. I think that's legendary. And what they're finding out more and more is that, that the elderly are now uh, much more castigated, uh, set aside. That the, the kids call them that the you know they're, the the, ch uh, the youngsters are the the government calls them waiting to you know the waiting for jobs group. If they're unemployed, and they call the elderly the waiting to die group. Um, <coughs> And uh, there has been, you know, marked decrease, you know, in how well the elderly are treated. Yeah, Joe. In in terms of the um, practical implications for child rearing of having child labor, mm -hmm. you know, if a child is considered someone who has economic value, then they're probably um, treated as someone who's more responsible. And I bet there'd probably be a lot less behavior problems. You know, someone who is considered an important partner in the household, as opposed to like today, childhood is considered kind of a time of leisure where kids just mess around and do whatever they want. And give you grief. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wonder if, if, in all the, the research that you've done, did you notice there was any dovetailing with? Uh, Significant historical events. Tausig noticed the rise of the uh, cottage industry. <laughs> well, not necessarily tariffs as much as wars. Right? Well, that's yeah, that's exactly right. That that's a good point. In fact, that uh, uh, Hohenberg, in a primary in economic history, says that there were some. You had at times in the early 1800s when when the prices of goods went up faster than wages. Precisely, this is the time of the Napoleonic Wars, <laughs> and uh, that uh, after. You know, really, with uh, after Waterloo, that you saw a general rise in the standard of living because uh, you know you didn't have all the young men going off to fight and the uh, wars draining off the resources. They had smaller things, you know, like the Crimean War and like, but but nothing quite like the Napoleonic Wars. I mean, Napoleonic Wars really nothing was seen in Europe again like that until the Cataclysm of 1914. And again, I'll, contrary to the belief of some of my colleagues, I was not there to see. That, um, <laughs> The uh, the assassination at Sarajevo. You just weren't there physically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we better let people go teach. So, call an end to this.